this God. Amen. I was reading something the other day, just thinking about our time of offering. It was a powerful little quote. The guy said, you know, God blesses you, not just, just so you can have a uh, higher standard of living, but that you sh so you can have a higher standard of giving. And I thought, oh, that's so good. It's so simple. And it's true. He's certainly interested in us prospering and enjoying life. But the real purpose behind the blessing of God is to be a blessing. And uh, he's working that in us because it's his nature. It's who he is. He enjoys giving. <clears throat> it's better to give. You know, it seems contrary, doesn't it, to our world system. But I tell you, it's so true. If we get freed up enough. So if you're here today for the first time, I want to welcome you. We've been in a series of messages just really... Um, seeking to be obedient to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. You know, a series of messages come and go, but the Word of the Lord remains forever. And if we can get our eyes on what God is saying, we can get hold of something that will actually change us. We've used as a bit of a launching pad, if you will, for a text, John's Gospel, chapter 16, just for the sake of kind of reminding us of where we've been launching from for today's message, I'd like you to turn there. If you got it, I will have it up on the screen as well. Here, John 16, beginning in verse 12. <clears throat> Jesus is the one speaking. He says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Father, I want to say thank you today again for your word, that it is life to those who find it. God, I thank you today for causing these words to become living words for each one of us as we spend this time slowing down to listen to you. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so in the previous sessions we've done, we spent uh, really in the first time we started talking from this passage, we spent a little time talking about the things that Jesus wants to say to us. I got many things I want to say to you. And let me just pause here for a second. Depending on the filter you have, how you see God, you might think that the things God wants to say to you are corrections and harsh things and whatever. But when he says here, I've got lots to say to you, but you can't bear it. It's not a He's not uh, tearing us down. He's actually building us up with this spray. He says, I've got such a destiny out in front of you. It's such an amazing thing I want to talk to you about. But you're not in a position to handle it yet. You, if I gave it to you right now, it would somehow not turn into a blessing. It would be a problem because there's areas inside that need work to be able to receive or to bear the greatness of my plan for your life. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. That's important because that should be, there should be a desire in us that says, God, I don't want to miss anything you have to say. So, you know, I'll never forget the time that I was single waiting on being married. And I was frustrated. Any, any frustrated single people in the house? Okay, a couple of you. Amen. I was there. And I remember thinking, God, you've just forgotten me and it's not going to happen. <clears throat> And I was one day just kind of complaining, I guess is a fair way of saying it. And the Lord, out of nowhere, he just spoke to me and he said, I'm preparing you for someone. And I'm preparing someone for you. And I knew that I knew that I knew it was the Lord talking to me. I knew that I knew that I knew that I wasn't forsaken and I wasn't going to spend my life single. And God had someone for me. And that actually... The reason for the delay, hear me today, there was a reason for the delay, and the delay was because God was preparing me 
to be the guy that he wanted me to be for her. And he was preparing her to be the gal he wanted her to be for me. There was a work going on. And so, so I was encouraged, number one, because I knew that God was wanting to bless me. And it was going to be such a great blessing that I was going to have to really be ready for it. Are you with me today? Amen. Amen. Come on, she's sitting here on the front row. <laughs> I believe in miracles. <laughs> You're the God of miracles. So once I got that revelation, you're preparing me for someone and someone for me, I got smart. I said, okay, if there's any way to speed this thing up, <laughs> come on, that's how you're thinking in these kind of situations. How can I expedite the process? Well, here's how. By saying, God, whatever you need to do in me, do it. Y'all can go home now. <laughs> That's enough right there. Whatever you need, if you're preparing me for someone, there's something that you want to bless her with that's not ready to bless her yet. There's something in me that's still under construction in a certain area. And listen, you're never going to be perfect when you meet the person you're going to marry. Get over that idea. <laughs> that's why God's putting you together to finish the process of perfection. <laughs> It's a whole other series of messages attached up in that one. <laughs> but there is an absolute level of readiness God's looking for. And so here's the deal for me. It fits so perfectly into this passage of Scripture. I've got many things to say to you, but you cannot now handle them. But I've sent the Holy Spirit, and His job will be to work on you to get you ready for me, is what Jesus would say. We can be assured Jesus is already ready for us. It's us that the work is going on, so don't try to change God. Realize that the area of change is not on his side of the equation in this particular idea. It's on us. And so God's working in us, not because he's mad at us. You got, don't lose sight of the heavenly calling. This is like, you've been honored, I've been honored, we've been favored by God that he's actually staring at us to be his bride. I've got many things I want to talk to you about, but you can't bear them. So here's the remedy. But I'm going to send my spirit. And my spirit is the spirit of truth. And he's going to guide you and lead you into all truth. You know, we have so many amazing things that are about to happen in people's lives. Destinies, divine destinies resting on us. And you might look at yourself every now and then, you get a little glimpse of something God wants to do in your life, and then you, you, you're like Mary uh, when the angel shows up to tell her she's going to conceive supernaturally the Messiah. And she says, you know, how can this be? Seeing that I don't know a man, I, I haven't had that kind of relationship. And, and, this, and the angel says, the Holy Spirit... Here's how it's going to happen. So whatever your question is, God, how, how are you going to fulfill that dream? Here's the answer. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. You see, I know not a man, she says. And heaven's going, yeah, and that's part of the plan. This isn't about man getting glory. It's about God getting glory. So if you could just kind of meet the right people and schmooze with the right people and kind of work your way up the career ladder, whatever it is you think you're going to, you're supposed to do. And you just, it's about knowing, no, no, it's about knowing him and letting the Holy Ghost get on your life and start shaping you and making you what he's ordained for you to be. The spirit loves willing, vulnerable hearts. And we've said it before, we'll say it again. Even if you're not willing, at least you can be willing to be made willing. So it's okay. So I'm not willing to be a missionary, but I'm willing to be made willing. <laughs> you can be assured that if it ever happens, God's going to have you in cooperation, ultimately, voluntarily, and enjoying it. That's the work of the Spirit right there. Heard so many testimonies, people who thought they would hate certain things, now it's their passion in life, all because of a vulnerability to the Holy Spirit. We struggle here. We struggle to release the reins. 
because we're afraid that God might take us somewhere or into something that we wouldn't like. And that in itself is a misconception of who God is. God is good, and God wants the best for you and me. His plans exceed your plans in every way. Monetarily, they exceed it. Emotionally, they exceed it. Everything God wants to do for you trumps your stuff. So we've all been called. The only way it's going to actually get pulled off, like with Mary, is the Holy Spirit's got to come on us to make it happen. That's Jesus, what he's saying. I've got so much for you to say to you, but you can't bear it. It's bearing the glory of God, bearing the image, bearing the purposes of God. And it's the Spirit who right now, in real time, is working with us. And so what we've been talking about is how functional is your relationship with the Holy Spirit? How functional is it? I mean, do you recognize his presence? What happens when he starts to speak to you or nudge you or reveal something to you? Do you question? Do you resist? Do you flow? Truth be known, we all do all of those. You know, we, we tend to, we all, that's why we're a work in progress. Thank God that he's committed to finish the work he's begun. But he's here to help us. That's why his title or a way, one of the ways of describing the Holy Spirit, I will send you the comforter, the helper, some translations say. Uh, this word parakletos, it's, it's one called alongside to help us accomplish the mission. It's a beautiful, powerful gift we've received, the person of the Holy Spirit. So we've spent the last few sessions just trying to ask the question and hopefully answer the question, do you know him? Do you know the Holy Spirit? Well, I know Jesus, but I don't really know the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit is God, and he wants to be known so that he can fulfill his ultimate ministry, which is to show us Jesus, ready us for the bridegroom, and to be all in all on the inside. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, just let me give you some thoughts here to mull on when we're talking about knowing him, because my prayer is this, that as we do what we're doing right now, we worship together, we pray, and we come here expecting more than just a religious service that we've checked off some box. We've come to encounter God. Come on. I am not content to come into a building just to fulfill some religious obligation. I want to touch him, be touched by him. I want to smell him. I want to feel him. I want his movement in my heart and life. I want to be changed by him. That is what our coming together is supposed to be about. And I believe God says it. He promises it. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. You have a promise. You will be filled. First Corinthians. So these are just scriptures to me that make me want to go harder after him. First Corinthians chapter uh, 2 verse 9 beginning there. But as it is written, Paul is speaking. I, Becky, you quoted it in your prophecy this morning. I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. That's talking about this great calling that's out there in front of us, all of us. Now here, look, check this out, verse 10. But God has revealed them unto us, how? By his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. If you want to know anything about God, you're going to have to get it through the Spirit. He's the one who knows everything about him. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us of God. You see, without having a functional relationship with the Holy Spirit, you and I are in the dark on our inheritance. We're groping around. And it's an interesting contrast. He says, we've not received the spirit of the world as if to say, you know, whatever spirit is behind a thing is the spirit that's going to talk to you about what that kingdom represents and what it has to offer. So if you're listening to the spirit of the world, it's over here baiting you and me 
with all kinds of temporal enticements. We, 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 we sang about it. It was in the room that today. God was crying out, let go of the earthly stuff. It's another spirit. It's another kingdom. But embrace me. And, and practically speaking, he's saying, let my spirit come. He's going to make known to you. Eye has not seen. Ear has not heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of man. The things which God has prepared. For those who love him. But he has revealed them to us. Now I think it's very accurate here. Biblically speaking. We could say it this way. He is revealing. Man does not live. By bread alone. But how? But by every word. That proceeds out. It is a present tense verb. Is proceeding. Out. Of the mouth of God. Now I'm not saying. Extra biblical things. That we're talking about. God speaking things that are outside of the scripture. I'm talking about things that have been spoken being made alive to you and me in this generation. He is right now revealing things to you and to me. And if you don't believe that, you know, I hear people say, well, he's already revealed everything he's ever going to reveal. Well, that's true, but he hasn't revealed it all to me. <laughs> Come on, stay with me today. He's revealed everything, but just not to me. I want my portion. I don't understand everything. I haven't got it all figured out. And if you do, you're in the wrong church. I'm just telling you, you're going to be really bored here, man, if you got it all figured out. You just sit there and criticize me every time I stand up to preach. If he could just get a revelation, I'd rather have you just move on and go torment some other pastor. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Woo, getting hot up here. Woo. <laughs> ah, you got to have fun in church. That's my motto. No fun, no glory. <clears throat> getting to know him. How functional is your relationship with the Holy Spirit? I can't answer that for you. That's a you and God thing. I'm just asking the question because I believe heaven is asking the question. Again, not because he's trying to highlight our dysfunction. See, God's not this way. He's not coming down here to rub our face in our inadequacies. He's come down here to lift our eyes up out of the quagmire and say, do you know who you are? Do you know your destiny? Why have you lost your dreaming heart? God's come, the Holy Ghost, to awaken us. Awaken us. To know him. To long to know him. You know, you say, well, I just want to know Jesus. And I say it with you, amen. And so in my pursuit of knowing Jesus, I read John 16, and Jesus says, i got lots I want to talk to you about, but you can't get it yet, so here's how I'm going to fix it. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. So if you really want to know Jesus and you really love Jesus, then you need to heed what he just said, which is, my Holy Spirit is on assignment to help you unstop your ears to hear. So if we really love Jesus, we got to love the Holy Ghost. Are you with me? If we really love Jesus, we got to love the Holy Ghost. Don't tell me you love Jesus and you despise the Holy Spirit. Many places minimize, marginalize the ministry and the person of the Holy Spirit. And they say they love Jesus. But you cannot love Jesus and not love the Holy Spirit. Now, many times I think it's just ignorance on our part. But God is in the business of removing ignorance. The spirit of truth comes. With this agenda, if you will, to guide us and lead us into how much truth? All truth. You could say it another way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. You see, Holy Spirit's come to guide us into Jesus. To make him real to us. To know him is an important process. We're all in it. We're growing in this knowledge uh, acquiring the right knowledge, the knowledge of the Lord. 
1 Samuel chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, 7 and 8. It's the story of Samuel the prophet, who's a, a young boy born out of a desperate woman's prayer. Don't have time to go into all of that here today. But God's hand is on him. Hannah devoted the child to the Lord. You give me a son, I'll give him back to you all the days of his life. God opens a barren womb at that prayer. And out comes Samuel. She brings him, according to her covenant commitment to the Lord, she brings him to the temple. She gives him to the priesthood she, as an offering to the Lord. He's there. She comes back and forth, and she visits him. Well, in his tenure there, as a kid now, he's been given to the Lord, and here he's beginning to have an encounter with heaven, the Holy Spirit. Verse 7, he's, had, he's woken a couple times prior to these verses hearing the voice of God, but not knowing it was God. Verse 7 says this, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So check it out. God's been speaking to Samuel, but he didn't know it was God. The verse 7 is pretty plain. Samuel did not yet know him. Now, let's just kind of break this down and make it super simple, hopefully. To know him is to understand his voice when he speaks. It's to know how to answer him. You see, Samuel, at that point, didn't yet know. And we're talking about getting to know the Holy Spirit, which means when he's speaking to you, you don't think it's just the pastor speaking to you. You see, that's where Samuel was confused. Samuel thought it was Eli. Actually, I don't get all of this. You might, I don't know. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong here. But it seems to me for Samuel to be confused, the voice he heard must have sounded like Eli's, who was at that time the priest. Must have sounded like it because he got up thinking Eli had called him. And he went in and said, yes, I'm here. I didn't call you. Go back to bed goes back to bed, and the Lord speaks again. It must have sounded like Eli's voice for some reason, but it wasn't Eli's voice. It was God's voice. And let me just ask the question real simply. How many times has God been speaking through someone to you? And that you thought it was just the preacher. You thought it was this. But it was the Holy Ghost talking to you. And yet we write it off, you know. Because we've not yet, in many cases, yet discerned who it is that's talking. Could it be that today, as I'm speaking right now, the Holy Ghost is talking to you? Could it be he's reaching out to you? So you could leave here today thinking, oh, Pastor Rob gave us a nice sermon and missed the point altogether. <laughs> if, in fact, something that comes through my mouth was actually God speaking to you. Bible is plain about this. Let him that speaks speak as the oracle or mouthpiece of God. I know it's a mystery. I don't get it. I just try to get out of the way when it's happening. You know, that's our, that's our, that's our highest privilege is to simply be available for something other than ourselves to come through us. I'm talking about the Lord. Samuel was confused. Verse 8, and the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Let me tell you something. I perceive that the Lord is talking to you. I perceive it. I sense it. I know it. So the Holy Spirit wants us to know him. Like Samuel, many of us, we are growing. We, we are, we're kind of hit and miss, maybe some, maybe never at all. God's been speaking to you. You didn't even know it was the Lord. I don't know, but I know this much. Just like with Samuel, God came once. Come on. God came a second time. Aren't you glad for this about God? He keeps on coming back. <laughs> 
He doesn't just say your name once. Is that, that's good news right there now. He's knocking. He's calling out. He's asking. He's talking. And he's waiting. And any good pastor, you know, Eli did the good thing. Eli, if you read on, he said, go back. <laughs> and if you hear that again, stop saying amen to the pastor and start saying amen to him. Was that to me or him? Him. Good. <laughs> Are you with me today? It's about answering him. It's about saying amen, which is so be it. I'm in agreement. I want that. Amen has become such a nice word in churches. And we've lost sight of the power of that word. Which is agreement. So according to Jesus, the spirit of truth, when he comes, he's going to guide us and lead us into all truth guides the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He wants to know us so that he can take us somewhere. So it starts off relationally. And, you know, he's he's all about he's a gentleman. He's he's very beautiful in the way this has been, been my experience with the Holy Spirit. He's he is a mighty rushing wind, but oh, he's so gentle. He's so beautiful. He's so powerful. He's so sweet. He's so personal. He's so concerned with the way I'm feeling when other people don't get it. And he's just precious. There's no one like the Holy Ghost. He knows how to comfort those that are that are suffering and going through hard, dark places. I tell you, there's no one like the Spirit of God who just comes and picks you up in your toughest moments of life. But he's cultivating a trust and a relationship because he wants to guide us somewhere. Years ago, we had the privilege, Christy and I did, of going to Italy. And actually, this church sent us there. How many years? It's been a while back, but it was an awesome. It was a dream of her life. A dream of her life. A history major. Never even thought we would ever be there. And we went to Italy. It was just off the chart. It was an amazing respite and just beautiful gift from God and from this congregation. And while we were in Italy, obviously, if you're in Italy, you're going to see some stuff, right? And you're going to see, I had a camera I had borrowed from Elaine Hutzel, and she had all these different big lenses. And I thought, yeah, I'll take a few pictures. I was lost behind that camera. I mean, every time I turned, it was like, oh, my gosh. And you could zoom in on these angels way up on top of these structures. And it's like, it's amazing stuff. So we took some guides, some tour guides. We were with a guide on a bus. We decided that was the best route to do it in, which was really smart. And as you know how that goes, the bus pulls up to a site. Everybody offloads. And it was crazy crowded. I mean, there's people from all over the world constantly streaming through the place. So everybody's trying to see the same sites. And these tour guides work together, you know, quite a bit. And they kind of know each other. And they have their drill. And they have their way of trying to organize tour groups. So they have a pole with a flag. A certain color flag represents your tour. Thank God for that. Yeah, there's a little flag flying. And then we had um, ear earpieces, battery packs, earpieces. And um, she would talk to all of us as a group, right? It was awesome. So you knew, and she was very, our guide was very straight up. She said, you know, listen, it's crazy out there. A lot of people out there. So just kind of hang close. Keep your eye on me, on the flag. If we start moving, move with the flag, you know, whatever. <coughs> and we're going to be here, and we'll go to each area, and we'll talk to it. We'll give a chance for answer, questions and answers. And when we get back on the bus, we can talk some more. So you know how that goes. So we're out there enjoying raw just history, just beautiful stuff, beautiful art and whatever. And every now and then you look up and where's the flag? Where's the flag? <laughs> oh, oh, there it is. Quick, come on, let's go. You know, and sometimes you'd get kind of like delayed because <laughs> somebody <laughs> would have a deeper interest and the tour is moving on, you know. So usually we could navigate that, but I'll never forget one day, you know, and, and another, another thing I realized, so there was two main um, ways of staying where you were supposed to be, the flag and the radio. Now, the radio, you know, because so the guide would say, okay, we're going to move on to the next site, you know, but sometimes you're in your own conversation, thinking and talking about your own stuff. 
And the guide says, we're moving on. And the whole group moves. And you look up, and you can't see the flag. And here's, check this out. One thing we learned the hard way is that those little radio devices have a range. <laughs> they have a range. And so we started hearing, like, everybody, <laughs> and we got to, No flag, no clue. Say that with me. No flag, no clue. That's where we were. No flag, no clue. You know? The whole time, the guide was trying to move us to where we needed to be. Provided ample time to take what we needed from each site. Depends on who you ask. You might not agree with the timing of the guide when it's time to move on. But if God is moving on, you're real smart to move on with him. How many times have people spent their life staring at wonderful things which can become problem things if you haven't moved with the cloud of God? He's moving. For some of you today, maybe you look up and you're saying, I can't see the flag and all you hear is static. Or maybe, here's the benefit. Well, one of the things we learned, we kind of learned, I don't know if this is a good thing or not, I shouldn't say this probably, but we kind of learned how to live when the static just started. <laughs> that was like, you better get moving now, buddy. How many of you live when the static just starts? Oh, my, this is better preaching than you're saying amen. I just, I, I'm interested in this Christian thing, and I'm going to go on with God. It's all good. But I got my stuff I want to kind of hang out around. Even good stuff. Even something the Lord brought you to. How many people are camped out, hear me today, around old moves of God? from which we are supposed to glean truth but move on in our generation, come on, to fulfill the purpose God has for us. There's a lot of static preaching in the ears of people but not in the mouth of the guide. The problem is not with God's articulation or his enunciation or his volume. It has nothing to do with God's stuff. It has everything to do with us paying attention to the one who's leading us somewhere. So the challenge is, Holy Spirit, I want to know you because you're going to reveal Jesus to me. But to know you is like Samuel. I've got to respond and recognize it's you talking to me. And then you're going to guide me somewhere, which means I'm supposed to be in movement. Jesus said it this way, Matthew 4, 19, come, follow me. You see, that denotes Jesus didn't come just to have a nice meeting. Jesus was coming to make disciples and take people somewhere. Come and follow me, and I will make you as you follow. I will make you fishers of men. You can't make yourself a fisher of men. You can't make yourself whatever it is God's called you to. Making happens while following you see, God ordains the steps of a righteous man. He's, he's put us on a path custom designed to equip us for our destiny. <laughs> every trial, everything you have to face and deal with by God's providence, if you're listening and participating, it goes a lot better, by the way, is designed to shape us in a certain way. For years, I struggled with the fact that I could not go to seminary. I suppose I could have if I had really pushed and demanded. But for me, it wasn't a part of the path. And I'm not against it. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I think it's awesome for those who God calls into that and people, you know, much smarter minds can read all that stuff, you know. But it just wasn't the path for my life. And I resisted it because why? Because I wanted the plaque. I wanted the thing to hang on the wall. I wanted to prove to people. If my preaching didn't prove it, I wanted the paper to prove it. Come on. I'm called by God, you know. Let me tell you what. The call of God is different 
It's different. When you're called, you know, God qualifies those who are called. God doesn't call those who are qualified. We, we think by getting myself all qualified, then I'm called. No, 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 no. God calls and then he qualifies you for whatever it is he's called you to do. The qualification, the training, if you will, it happens on the path. And, you know, many of you have heard my story, but here it is just real quick. I kept saying, God, I want to go to school. I knew I was called. I felt the call of God. I said, I'm going to school then, right? And he said, no, you're in school. Pay attention. I said, mm, that can't be God. Let's try that again. I want to go to school. Or I need, I felt the need to go to school. And God wasn't arguing about the issue of needing to go to school. He said, I know you need a lot of, you need a lot of help, man. <laughs> Trust me, I get that part of where you are. You need schooling. But you're in school. Pay attention. Are you learning? Can the Spirit of God talk to you right where you are? Or have we said to him, God, if I could just get in a better set of circumstances, then, then I could fulfill my destiny. You know, just read your Bible a little more. Read Joseph in the pit, in prison, promoted and demoted for doing the right thing, not the wrong thing. Over and over again, all of these things are the ways in which, you know, people want the acts of God, but not many people hunger after the ways of God. And the ways of God are mysterious, sometimes uh, confusing, it seems, because you can't figure out why he's taking you on a certain path. But if you've committed your life to Jesus Christ, let me qualify something here. If you've said, amen, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. If you did that in a sincere heart to the Lord, then your life is not your life and the destiny of your life is in his hand. And you should be real happy about that because he's got a way better plan than you have for your life. You don't have to second guess where you are. God's the one, you know, talking about tour guides, I just got to get this one out. One funny story. So in Italy. <coughs> This tour guide was, I, you know, I've, I've, over the course of my life, I've been in a couple settings where I've been on tours. Much, many of you have done the same. And as a pastor, I remember watching this tour guide thinking, you know, that is a lot like pastoring. That would just drive you crazy, man. And it felt great not to be on duty on the tour. I was just on the receiving end because this guy's chasing all these people trying to, where, where, where did Sue Smith go? She's in the bathroom. I'm thinking, I, I recognize that. <laughs> where, where is that? Where, you know, it's everything just all over the place. And I'm just thinking there. And so I, I kind of determined in my own heart I was going to be the best congregant I could be for this guy. When he said we were leaving, I'm Johnny on the spot. I'm there waiting in line because I wanted to be a good congregant for our pastor tour guide. So I got a little close to him, and he was sharing some stories with me. And uh, one of them was this gal <coughs> that one time got locked in a bathroom. You know, they have bathroom breaks. And some bathroom stall, she was in the stall, not the bathroom itself, but the st in, well, if you're locked in the stall, you're locked in the bathroom. I guess it's all the same. But anyways, she got locked in the stall. It was one of these Italian locks, I guess. I don't know. It was like something different maybe than we're used to using, but it wasn't working. And she started panicking because she was afraid that the tour bus was just going to leave without her. You know, imagine what it would be like to be in a foreign country in the bathroom <laughs> and lose your tour bus. I mean, they're gone. They're on to the next major city or something, you know. So she started freaking out. So she started screaming, help, help, because she just couldn't. She tried and tried and tried to get out wouldn't unlock. So the tour guide heard her screaming. So he comes in. He says, ma'am, what's the problem? She says, I can't get out. He says, it's locked. He says, okay, try this, try that. You know, nothing would work. So in his Italian clothes, <laughs> sports coat, nice tour guide. He was styling, too. He was just like, he was the guy, you know. There's a gap about that big underneath this thing, <laughs> underneath the door. This guy gets down on the floor. He slides up <laughs> underneath into her stall. Click. Unlocks the door. 
everybody's getting out. He gets out and he says, you know, the, the real kicker to the whole thing was she wasn't even a part of my tour group. <laughs> He said, you know, on days like that, you just go, I love my job. <laughs> but, you know, if you're a real, a real minister of the, the tour, you care about people that are stuck. Real tour guides care about people that are stuck. Let me tell you, the Holy Ghost cares about you if you're stuck. Stuck in that place, crying out, help! <laughs> Afraid everybody's going to leave you behind. Thank God he's got a good sense of humor. He's patient. He can come get us all right where we are. How do you stay in range so that the radi radio signal... <clears throat> And the flag never go out of view. How do you keep from getting lost in this whole thing? Well, I think there are times where God will let you get out of range. It's my ex own experience. I don't think it's God's preference, but I do think it's one of the ways we learn. You ever been through a season when you were just saying to yourself, I just can't seem to hear God for anything. I remember I was talking to somebody one time and they were feeling so far away from God. They said, I, you know, and I said, well, why don't, why don't you, you know, why don't you talk to the Lord? And he said, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. And I said, well, why don't you tell God what you just told me? person kind of looked at me like, I said, yeah, why don't you just tell him what you just told me? Like, I feel so far away. I wouldn't even know where to begin talking. I said, why don't you just tell him what you just told me? And it was like this revelation went off inside the person like, hadn't thought about that. Like, the idea that God would care enough and be personal enough to actually meet me in a moment of truth. You see, God loves truth. He is the spirit of truth. And if the truth is, I feel so far away from God. I'm speaking to some of you here today. I don't know who in particular. I can sense it in my heart. I don't even know. I, wouldn't, I don't even know what to say to him. Say that to him. God, I don't even know what to say to you. I feel far away. I can, I tell you, the spirit of God comes for those kind of words. He'll start talking to you in a place that's so personal and so real and so unmistakably God talking and not a man. That's my experience. It's his love. It's his ministry. It's who he is. He's a good tour guide. And if you're stuck, he's willing to get down where you are, come under the door, come up on the inside and unlock the thing for you. He's willing to do it for you. You know, we confuse holiness with an unwillingness to get in the dirt where we live. And I'm telling you, though, Jesus was holy he hung out with sinners. Holiness isn't intimidated by our problems. It's greater than our problems. And holiness comes to untangle us from our problems. It's powerful. If We'll let him in. What happens in your stuck situations when the Holy Ghost comes sneaking up under the door you're stuck behind? <laughs> I don't, you know, I'm just thinking about this as we go here. But what must it have been like for that woman trapped in that stall that day when the tour guide laid his life down and his good clothes and came crawling up under the stall? Do you think she made some room for him? 
I mean, there couldn't have been much room in there. We've all been in stalls before, we know. Come on, she had to make some room for the guy to come in. He was her help. How much room have we made for the Lord to come in? So, I just have a couple more thoughts and I'm going to land the plane here. I believe the Spirit of God, commissioned by Jesus himself, I will send you the comforter. He's been sent to us, assigned because God wants us to know him, the Spirit. He wants to reveal to us, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it any, but I'm going to reveal to you the great things that are in store for you. That's the Spirit doing that. He's going to not only talk to us about our destiny, come on, hear me, he's going to start guiding us toward it. There is movement implied in the Spirit's ministry. He will guide you and me. He's going to take us somewhere, which involves cooperation. Watch the flag. Don't, let, don't live in the static zone even of the good things in Christianity when God is moving. Stay close. Value. I tell you, I developed a great relationship with some of these guides, man. I'm like, you're my friend. You know everything about all the stuff we're looking at, and you are the guy that's going to get me back to my airplane when this trip is over. You lose sight of your God, you are in a fix. But God, the Holy Ghost, has come. He's come to help us. And he's come with a reason. Let's just finish here. Genesis chapter 24, verse 33. You know the story. Let me give you the quick backdrop. Abraham's wife, Sarah, has died. Abraham, called by God to all bless all the nations of the earth through his line. He has a son, Isaac. Isaac doesn't have a wife. And Abraham knows that he's, he's got a few years left and he's out of here. He's got to figure out how to get this thing going on. So he sends his servant, Abraham's servant, a beautiful picture of the person of the Holy Spirit being sent to go get a bride for the son. Come on. The father, Abraham, has a son. God the father has a son, Jesus. God the father, in this case, is saying, I want a bride for my son, and I need someone to go get her. And he sends his servant a picture, clearly, of the Holy Spirit to go find the bride. You know the story. It's a great story. You've studied it, many of you. I realize that. But here it is anyways. Servant goes out. Servant says, listen, says to Abraham, you know, I'm happy to go do that. But what happens if I get out there and she won't come with me? And he says, well, if she won't come with you, it's not on you. Abraham said, it's not your fault. It's her fault. <laughs> not yours, it's hers. You're released from this thing. He says, swear to me, though. Put your hand on my thigh. Swear to me that you're not going to go into another country. You're going to go into the right place to find this bride, and it's going to be of the right line, whatever, da 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 Yep, got it. And you're not guilty if she doesn't come. So he shows up. He's got an entourage, camels, ten camels, laying down with all kinds of wealth, demonstrating the guy that's on the other end of this stuff, okay, to her, her husband-to-be. And he prays a prayer, and he says, oh, God. Pulls up at the watering hole where all the women show up. He says, let the woman who comes out that I see and ask her for a drink of water, says, who says back to me, not only will I give you water, but I'll water your camels. He said, that one is the one. Let her be. And so as he's yet speaking, the Bible says, as he's yet speaking those things, here comes Rebecca. She shows up, and he says, can you give me some water? And she says, yes, and I'll give your camels too. And he's like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. It's happening. You ever been in one of those kind of church meetings? Oh, my gosh. That was like this morning, man. Worship was off the chart. I was just so enjoying the presence of the Lord. Right? But notice this. He doesn't, he doesn't say anything until after she's done watering ten camels. Now, it's one thing to say the right things. She said the right things. But it was another thing to do what you said. Oh, nobody's even talking to me now. I'm talking about doing what you said. Let me, I'll give you a drink and I'll give your camels. He's like, that's awesome. It starts with a testimony. 
And then she proceeded. I don't have the exact number in front of me, but my memory says it's like 150 gallons, 15 gallons of water each per camel, I think is right. Now check me out, somebody, and fix me if I'm wrong. Which you enjoy doing, I know. <laughs> a lot of water. Lots of water. Okay? 150 gallons. I like the sound of that. Sounds big. 150 gallons. Lots. I mean, she's drawing water. And, and the whole time, the servant is just watching, going, it's looking good. <laughs> Not only is she talking, she's walking. Not only did she say the right thing, she's doing the right thing. This is good, man. There's a sign here that something's up. And so finally, finally, she finishes, and he announces, yay, you did it. Guess who I am? Guess where I'm coming from? And so she goes and she, he says, well, do you have any room at your house? Goes, oh, yeah, we got plenty of room. We can come. She goes and gets her brother. Brother comes out. And that's where we're going to pick up here. Genesis 24, verse 50. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, because he shares the story. You know, the servant tells all that he'd done, how he prayed, and that the master had sent him, and all these things, how she watered the camels and all that stuff. Then Laban, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, back up. 24, verse 33. My bad. Are we there? Okay. And there was set meat before him to eat. So he gets to the house. They've welcomed him in, and they're starting to feed him. And here's what he says to them. This is the whole family, Rebecca's family. But he said, this is a servant talking now. I want you to think about the Holy Spirit here. I will not eat until I have told you my errand. Or let's say it this way. I'm not going to just hang out and have a nice church meeting without telling you why I'm here. There are whole, there's such a tendency today. We just want to have a great meeting. Sit down and eat with the Spirit of God. Oh, it's awesome. Did you feel his presence today? Ooh, church was off the chart. Yay. What a meeting. Awesome. The Spirit says, and the people are saying, hang out with us, sit here, be with us. We want to be the church known as the place of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to do one lap just because I can't resist it. <laughs> oh. You say, what is that about? I don't know. I just know if I don't do it, I'm disobedient. <laughs> That's how I feel anyways. Just a good meeting. And the Holy Spirit says, no, I'm not sitting down to eat with you until I've told you why I'm here. And if you are in agreement with why I'm here, break out the wine and crackers. Come on. I'm in. New wine, it's a biblical term for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. All right. You see the difference. The Spirit has come to do more than just make us feel good. He's come to get a people prepared and on path to her bridegroom, the Lord Jesus. I'll go back to our first verse, John 16. I have many things I want to say to you, but you're not ready. But when the Spirit comes, He's going to get you ready. He's going to help you because you're going to be my bride forever. And we're going to rule the galaxies together. I hasn't seen you can't even get your head around this. That's why my spirit's got to come and, and help you. So the spirit. So they say, thankfully, the family says, yes, go ahead. Talk to us. Tell us your Aaron. He tells the Aaron. Now, check this out. I got to get it out. I'm almost done. Genesis 24, same passage, same flow, same context. They're all there eating. And he's been telling the story about what happened. Genesis 24, now verse 50. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. And when Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. And the servant brought out jewelry of silver and gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah, he also gave to her brother and to her mother costly ornaments. And the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away 
to my master. Let me just pause and give a quick flashing by insight here. The gifts didn't come out until the agreement was in place. They said, here's why, I, the Spirit says, here's why I've come. I'm come looking for a bride. Are you in agreement with it? And the family said, it's from the Lord. We're in agreement. And as soon as the servant heard that, he started pulling out gifts. Now, you might not agree, and I'm okay if you don't, but I believe there's a lot of things waiting to be given that are on the other side of some of us saying amen to the purpose of God. Amen to the purpose of God. The servant knows when to give and when to hold back because it's not about just giving gifts. I want the gift of prophecy. I want. Why do you want it? Is it for the purpose of the preparation of the bride? Or is it so you can go strut around and show all your friends? I would do another lap, but I just am going to pause. There's all kinds of stuff, reasons, potential reasons. And here the Spirit of God says, if I can just find a people who will say amen to my errand, to what I'm working with, why I'm doing it. I will hold back no good thing from that people. I will pour money on that people. I will pour giftings and anointings that you've not even dreamed about on your life. If we're aligned with the purpose for which he was sent to bring us to our bridegroom. So it's such a good story. The morning comes, he says, the servant says, okay, we've had our party, send me away now to get on with the business. And the brother and the mother said, let the young woman remain with us a little while, at least 10 days. After that, she may go. But he said to them, do not delay me, since the Lord has prospered my way, send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, let us call the young woman and ask her. And they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. You know, one of the greatest things we can do, I, I know for me as a pastor, and as a local church, one of the greatest things we can do is when the Spirit of God starts showing up and saying, I've come for a bride, and I'm giving out giftings and graces to move her into her purpose. And when in a local setting, like this was a family who loved their sister or their daughter, and now she was having to step out into something unknown, that family had to make a decision. Will I support what the Holy Ghost is doing in someone's life or not? You see, we spend a lot of times building churches, and as the saying goes, a church isn't measured by its seating capacity. It's measured by its sending capacity. Can you hear something from the Holy Ghost and will we get around what God is saying to people and see it happen? Simple question, important question. Why? Because I know that right now the Holy Ghost is moving around this congregation, whispering things to people about dreams and visions and destinies that are on your life. And the day may come when God may say, I want you to birth something or I want you to do something. It may not mean that you physically leave this local church and go to, on the mission field. It could be. Who knows? But whatever it is, the point is, somewhere along the line, the family, come on, and the individual need to weigh in and say, we, we're with you, Holy Ghost. We want to do it. I, I could go on and on, and I'm not going to. We're going to pray this morning because I just want to let the Spirit of God seal what he's talking to us about today. Many of you are called. Few choose or say amen. I believe today that God is looking among us. You remember the spirit in Genesis chapter 1? Come on. What was he doing? Hovering over a barren wasteland desolate, broken, nothing pretty, and yet the Spirit of God was hovering in anticipation of God's Word being spoken, and now the creative genius of God would be put into place. I believe that's true right here today. 
I believe with all of my heart you're not here by accident today. Every one of you, myself included. You didn't just wander in here and your parents didn't just make you come. God has something in store for each one of us. Father, I want to just say right now, <coughs> can we stand up together? I just want to pray and make room here for the Spirit of the Lord to just accomplish what's in his heart. Samuel did not realize that it was the Lord speaking to him. Lord, you know today what you've been speaking to each person in this building. None of us here without destinies preordained by you. Your desire is good toward us, God. I thank you today for somehow, Lord, breaking past the barriers that we've set up. And even if we're stuck in the stall, Lord, for getting down where we are and coming up where we are, we make room for you today. And God, I believe it's your desire to hear each one of us weigh in on the reason you've sent your spirit. You've come not to just bless us with stuff, but to take us somewhere. And I thank you today that you're waiting for each one of us. And I, I just would ask right now, Lord, as you stare into this congregation, you stare into each heart here today, God, for me, right now, I say to you, yes, I will go with you. Yes, I will leave the comforts of all that I've known, the predictable stuff, the things that I have built my life around. Should you call me in some other way, here I am. Jennifer, can you play some? I just want to give a few moments here. I just want to make some room up here at the front for you today. Just come on out, stand up here somewhere if God is speaking to you. And in your heart, you're just saying, and there's no pressure here today. You know how this goes. It's just... It's more about what heaven sees than what people see. It's got to be about what God is staring at today. If in your heart, you're just wanting the Lord to know, I'm here, Lord. Your servant is here. Speak to me. to hear your prayer. He longs to hear your voice. He longs, it may be simple, it may be even desperate, it might not be full of scripture, it might be just from the heart. Just tell him in your own way, here I am. Yes, Lord. Hanging 
out too long when you moved and I should have moved with you and I didn't, Lord. Letting a life of static, living in the static, the in and out. I don't want it anymore, God. There's nothing worth more Jesus. than will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living yes, hope. Yes, oh God. Your presence, yes, Lord. Jesus, have your way right now. Thank you, Father. Fill this place. Fresh baptism of fire. Your presence, Fresh baptism. Fresh baptism of your spirit, God. And Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long. to him. He sees you when you cry out to him. He sees you as you long for him. Let us become more aware of your presence, God. Thank you. Thank you. make Jesus real to us. Magnify the Son. Glorify the person that we've been espoused to. Oh Jesus, we want to see you as you are, not as men have made you. We want to know you. Thank you.
I just felt like the Spirit of God spoke to my heart and he just said, he heard you. <laughs> he's seen you. He's seen your amen. And he's thrilled. And then these words came to me. So pack your bags. <laughs> pack your bags. I don't think that means physically pack your bags. It could to some, I don't know. But I, I, just, I just believe he's saying, okay, Rebecca. Okay. Let's go. Let's go. I want to I wanna take you. I want to show you your bridegroom. You know, the Bible says that when Rebecca saw Isaac, she jumped off the camel, <laughs> having never met him. After she asked the question, who's that guy? It's him. Father, I want to thank you right now. You know how to apply those simple words, pack your bags to each one of us, what that really means. It's about readiness to go with you. It's about a willingness, Lord, to step out into something new, something great, something divine, something beautiful. And I release your blessing today, Lord, just as, as your simple servant here, as a pastor that you've set here, Father, what a privilege for me to just release your blessing over these that are hungry here in this house. I say the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. Lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen.